BA in MA in classical studies is now a oh, doctor, doctorant completing his FD with King's College London. His research is primarily concerned with the kinesthetic, spatial, and cognitive methods by which collective memory was generated in archaic and classical Athens. Uh, Good afternoon. Can you hear me, first of all? Are you able to hear me? Hi. Uh, do you, would you like to share your screen? Do you have a you have a presentation? Certainly. Okay. You. I think you can do it. Can Great. you see my presentation? You can see your presentation and your face. Perfect. Fantastic. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry to not be there in person, but I'm coming to you from a uh, rainy South Wales uh, this afternoon. Um, and today, I'd like to talk a little bit about. <clears throat> access limitations, <clears throat> excuse me, and prescribed urban movement in Hellenistic Sirene. So the 4th century BC Stele, commonly referred to as the Sirene Cathartic Law, stood outside the city, city's primary sanctuary to Apollo, and is, presents, is presented as an oracular response from the god himself. However, it is generally agreed that rather than a direct oracle, the stele indicates the standardization of existing regulation, regulations by the Sirene state, which was sent to Delphi for approval. As a text, the law deals with various forms of potential pollution which could be incurred in Sirene, including via the body, via terms of aggressive acts and external attack. As a notion, purity and pollution as religious categories operated to enforce functional worldviews into the daily lives of ancient Greeks which, whether for individuals, groups, or the city as a whole, were determined by set spatial access, limitation, and demarcation. Today, I want to consider how these forms of access and limitation required prescribed urban movements from Serene identity are rooted in bodily experiences of being and moving in material space, the consideration of kinesthetic experience in Greek religious practices allows us to more fully comprehend its formative force, something very evident in this text. Importantly, at two points in the cathartic law, purifying rites are indicated as reinforcing the conceptual boundaries of Sirene as a civic religious space. The first of these directs the sacrifice of a red billy goat at the front gates of the city at the shrine of Apollo Apotropaios if disease or famine struck the city. Acts of sacrifice or banishment beyond the city walls are well-established features of community-wide purifications in Greek antiquity. But what we should note is that in performing such rites, the conceptual spaces of a given city would be reinforced. Attributions of sacrality rely on the distinction of differing spaces and their uses in order to create visible and invisible boundaries by which conventions and behavior are maintained. This communally observed and protective sacrifice at the periphery of the city would certainly uh, reinforce these boundaries. This is also exhibited in the regulation on phase B of the Sealy on the uh, right hand side of the slide here, which describes the means by which an evil spirit sent against the house could be banished. If believed to be have, have been sent by a dead or unknown person, the house owner made figurines of either wood or clay and entertained them possibly over the course of three days. After this period, the figures were processed out of the home, out of the city, and finally deposited in an unworked wood. That is to say, a space clearly differentiated from the inhabited and cultivated spaces associated with the city. I will not dwell on these examples, but it's important to note how purificatory rites would have operated to support on both collective and individual levels, the conceptualized and functionally bounded space of the city. A more precise example of states of purity or pollution impacting an individual's spatial access or exclusion is suggested in the regulations relating to men who have had sexual intercourse. For those wishing to gain entry to the sanctuary of Apollo, the timing of when they had last had intercourse determined their ability to do so. If at night, then any incurred pollution dissipated the following morning, 
However, if intercourse had taken place during the day, several prescribed acts and limitations are illustrated as being imposed. Before entering the temenos of the sanctuary, the visitor would have to cleanse themselves at the fountain at the northeastern foot of the Acropolis and just outside the sanctuary. Even after which, some sections of the sanctuary, not mentioned specifically in the stele, were still excluded. While this regulation certainly pertains to the sanctuary of Apollo, the fact that even after cleansing, some spaces were still prohibited inside the sanctuary suggests that other sacred sites around the city may also have been accessible for a period, and this is the case on other purificatory regulations. The journey to the fountain and washing therein thus represents prescribed actions for any man polluted from daytime sexual activity wishing to visit the sacred spaces associated in the city. In order to not be limited in his interaction with the religious life and actions of the community, a polluted man would have to perform a specific movement down to the sanctuary in order to have access to the rest of his city, and even then, not the entire space of the sanctuary. <coughs> a more obvious association between specific journeys to this sanctuary and formative experience is exhibited at, start, at the start of phase B, which concerns regulations relating to women in essence, it directs the socio-religious initiations women underwent in transitioning from being betrothed, becoming ma married, becoming pregnant and or experiencing miscarriage, and all in relation to the Temple of Artemis. Before transitioning from the parental household to that of her husband, brides are directed to go down to Artemis before the pollution of sexual intercourse. This passage on your slide indicates the manner in which purity was maintained via the intersection between bodily acts and spatial arenas. Indeed, the bride must not come under the roof of her husband, but proceed instead to the sanctuary of Artemis before the marriage is consummated. What rites were performed there is unclear. However, for those engaged in premarital sex, the penalty was to cleanse the entire sanctuary and to sacrifice a fully grown victim. Here we also have the word quotaterion, which has been translated as meaning both the bridal chamber, but also possibly a room for those that were charged with cleaning the temple in order to sleep in, in order to sleep in for several days. And there are several uh, subterranean ch chambers associated with this temple, which have been suggested as being these um, sort of incubation chambers. The requirement to attend Artemis for young women on the virgin marriage is of course in keeping with wider Greek tradition. But what the cathartic law here underlines is that in Serene, this manifested in distinct prescribed movements between the contexts of familial home, the sanctuary, and finally the new marital home. This journey down to the sanctuary of Artemis was in fact the first of a series which newly married women would perform. The passage here on the left has been interpreted as relating to the purificatory rite at some point after a woman had consummated her marriage and is indicated as being taken, taken place as soon as possible. And then the festival of the Artemisia. This included those that had not previously gone down and who had to make purificatory sacrifices. In her discussion of the cathartic law, Jennifer Larson notes that the likely congregation of new brides at the festival indicates it as a public rite of passage into married life. Pregnancy demanded yet another journey down to the sanctuary, for which the petition of safe childbirth from the goddess would have been the main reason. Interestingly, this passage also makes explicit mention of her remaining pure on the seventh, eighth and ninth days of the month. While it is likely this refers to sex, it is also possible to include types of food, as with other regulations associated with Artemis on Delos. It is unclear if these abstentions were enacted before or after the birth, and both scenarios have been suggested. However, Emily Kern's observation that the 10th day after the birth, although aligning with an infant's naming, is perhaps too soon for intercourse to resume. Thus, it is suggested that it was through her pregnancy and for three days every month that a woman was to remain pure. How close to birth, was ex how, how close to birth a woman was expected to go, go down to Artemis is unclear, but I believe it is important to note that for those that were towards the end of their pregnancy, the journey to the sanctuary would not have been an overly comfortable one, 
Indeed, the main road leading from the Agora descended around 100 metres into the valley in which the sanctuary lay. In performing this prescribed journey to the sanctuary, the experience of a pregnant woman wishing to invoke the aid of Artemis may have been framed by the strenuous act of walking down into and out of this valley. Overall, what these three regulations make clear is how the repeated, the repeated trip to the sanctuary would have framed the experience of a young woman's passage into adult and married life. Going down to Artemis framed the transitional movement between her parental home, her becoming socially recognized as a wife and her becoming a mother. The cases of childbirth and mis miscarriage are well understood as causing pollution in ancient Mediterranean thoughts. But what the Serena cathartic law underlines is how this would have been experienced via the domestic and urban frameworks of a city. If the fetus was distinguishable, the pollution caused was that equal to a death. Surprisingly, the law makes no detailed mention of death pollution, yet the period of pollution caused from childbirth and death is seemingly differentiated here. For those belonging to a household where death had taken place, access to sanctuaries and temples could be forbidden for up to several weeks, as in other purification regulations. Miscarriage could thus install significant limitations on where and in what ways one could interact with the religious environs of the city. Most significantly, access to the entire sanctuary of Apollo would be denied for at least some time. Conversely, if the fetus was not distinguishable, the law makes clear that a period of pollution equal to that of childbirth was initiated. This would mean limitations on access to religious sites again, but only for a period of three days. Rather than being associated with kinship, the pollution is perceived as being spread by proximity, or more specifically in coming close to or within a house in which a birth had taken place. Outside of the house, pollution could not be spread from person to person. Rather, it was the building in which the birth had taken place that was the source. As, when, as well as limiting the actions of those under the roof, the house itself might be avoided by religiously anxious persons. While a character in the truest sense, the superstitious God-fearing man described by Theophrastus, avoids such buildings entirely, and this perhaps reflects a general approach, a approach to buildings in which childbirth had taken place. Thus the regulations surrounding childbirth in the law can be seen to have impacted the manner in which individuals interacted with the urban landscape of the city. For those under the roof, access to sacred spaces would be limited for several days, whilst those not wishing to partake in the same pollution would have to avoid those buildings where, they, where it's taken place altogether. A more difficult passage on face A rel relates to the rights of access to the shrines and tombs of the heroes associated with the founding of Sereni. In essence, it stipulates that both those who are pure, hagnoi, and profane, baboloi, could enter the shrines of Batos, the founder of Sereni, Onimastos, a seer from Delphi, and Atutopateres, the three fathers of the three, uh, yeah, the three fathers of the three ancestors of the city. Jennifer Larson has again suggested that Hagnoi, referred to in the law, likely meant those that belonged to the priesthoods um, of the city and were subject to specific purity requirements, while Babaloi could mean all others except for murderers, on which more in a moment. While the shrines of these founding heroes are thus evidenced as widely accessible, what this passage does make clear is that for those who were of a pure status, there existed a direct prohibition on their coming into contact with places associated with death, including graveyards. This again finds reflection in Theophrastus' description of the superstitious man who avoids coming near tombs. I shall return to this previous slide as he mentions it there. As we have seen, while pollution could not be incurred from entering a premises in which death had occurred, could it could be uh, incurred from entering a premises in which death had occurred, here we have a direct limitation on certain spaces that um, those considered Hagnoi could interact with. Sites such as the vast necropolis, which align the road between Sereni and Apollonia, 12 miles to the west, and those on the southeastern edge of the city, would have to be negotiated with caution. If Hagnoi does, does indeed refer to cult personnel, it suggests that the northern entrance to the city, which passed directly through these necropolis, would have been unfavorable, unfavorable if not outrightly prohibited. 
I want to finish this examination of how the Serenely Cathartic Law impacted movement and experience by returning to the final section of the text, which sets out regulations for apply, uh, regarding supplicants. In the case of murderers, autophonos, rules of pollution, purification and re-entry into society were negotiated between degrees of access and limitation within the space of the city. Initially, anyone guilty of murder coming to Serenely seeking purification would be barred from the sanctuaries of the city, including the shrines of the tombs of the founding heroes. The person seeking purification is illustrated as being presented to the civic political body of the city, as indicated by the use of the word polis and the three tribes. This initial action was to take place in a space which could involve the whole community. However, it is unlikely that, the, that this was the agora, um, because in at least Athens, this was explicitly forbidden. In being cleansed of his pollution, the supplicant sat on a white, a white fleece at the threshold, the udos, of an undisclosed building, either that of a house or the sanctuary of Apollo, um, are more likely rather than the edge of the city itself. After their cleansing and anointment, the suppliant is to go out into the public road and witness by a silent congregation of the city's citizens, while an announcer most likely made it known that the individual had been cleansed and was being reintroduced into society. Sadly, at this point, the text breaks, breaks off for possibly 20 lines. However, we can see again how states of purification and pollution would have been experienced via access and limitation to the urban spaces of the city. For a murderer, the socio-religious liminality of their state would have been communicated to both themselves and others via their sitting at the boundary of the threshold, as well as the obvious prohibition on access to various spaces around the city. Likewise, after being cleansed, the suppliant was reintroduced into society by walking on the public road in full view of the community. The main northern road, which went from the city's eastern entrance, past the Agora and down to the sanctuary, is likely what is meant here. The state of pollution in supplicated murderers would have been framed and visually communicated to the, communicate, uh, for, to the community by limitations and access on various spaces. So to summarise, by examining the regulations described in the Serenely Cathartic Law, in relation to its impact on movement and spatial access or limitation, the urban environment of the city is revealed as an essential medium by which notions of purity and pollution could be experienced and communicated to the community. Naturally, a primary focal point was the sanctuary of Apollo, along with its temple to Artemis. As we have seen, journeys to this space would have been necessary in order to gain access to other environments of the city other sanctuaries and temples if polluted from sex, and in order to occupy the marital home for new brides. Indeed, it is for women that the prescribed trips to the sanctuary are most fully revealed, with it enacting and communicating different points of passage from girlhood to motherhood. Purificatory regulations described within the Serenity Law also indicate they're operating with, within and reinforcing the conceptual boundaries of the city something that would also impact the movements of those of pure status with regards to the necropolis that surrounded the Northern Road out of the city. Finally, as we have just seen, for murderers seeking entry into the community of Serenity, not only would specific areas of the city have been entirely forbidden, including the Agora, but their reintroduction to society was visually communicated by limiting boundaries and then a leading out into publicly displayed uh, spaces, the road. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to say that while I've focused on um, specific movements within the, within the city, a more um, fruitful way of looking at this, which I didn't have time to in this paper, is the impact and the evocation of collective memories in a city. And I'd be happy to discuss this um, uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Very interesting lecture. Uh, any questions? Uh, perhaps uh, via Zoom, uh, questions through the Zoom?
questions? Well, actually, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, very much. Oh, here you are, uh, Ben, um, for that very interesting paper um, and a really interesting uh, uh, inscription or series of inscriptions. I actually, while you were talking, was wondering exactly what you mentioned at the end, say so you would say more about, which is um, public memory, how would, things were known, remembered, enforced, mm. and this sort of thing. It's, you know, these are, uh, one always worries about, uh, wonders about this exact question, practical, the practical application of, for example, laws of purity when, you, anyway, if you, if you could talk exactly about, about that, what you just mentioned. Okay. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, the, the notion of collective memory, um, as it's very broadly and um, variously discussed, uh, works on the assumption that the, uh, a given community operates within an understanding of itself and its behavioral patterns. Uh, and these behavioral patterns are not only uh, prescriptional in the sense that one knows how to knows how to perform certain actions in certain situations, but they, they are also um, embodied through repeated um, movements uh, in ritual contexts or otherwise. Um, in the sense of the, the, um, the Serenity Cathartic Law, we've, I think we've got several good examples of the way that these memories were both generated and expressed. Um, if we look at the, the, the very repetitive um, nature of having to go down to the sanctuary of Artemis um, for women at various uh, stages in their, in their sort of um, transmission from girlhood to motherhood and at points which could be chronologically fairly close to one another. If we imagine um, a, a pre-marriage, immediately post-marriage um, and then becoming pregnant um, journeys, that, that prescribed trip would be described, I'm thinking of uh, Paul Connison here, who, who looks at um, gestural, gestural action um, and especially things like processions and dances as enabling a, a, a cultural memory of a society to be embodied in the individual. Um, and it is bi-directional. So in this instance, if we imagine an individual woman who has, has gone down to the Temple of Artemis, and interestingly, before I proceeded, the Temple of Artemis would have been a, a, a you know, a, a, a locus point for a, a young girl, even before she was on the, the brink of becoming married. So even at that point, it would have been a repeated action, uh, surely. So for the individual woman, the, the repetitive action the, uh, of going down to the sanctuary would have been a way for her to cultivate a collective memory with her society because she would have, it would have been mirrored in others um, doing the same thing. At the same time, same time, it would have been forward looking. She would have had an understanding that she would have, um, she would have been going down there at a future event, whether she became you know, pregnant or if she unfortunately miscarried. Um, with the case of the, uh, the tombs, um, we know that the, the sanctuary of Batos was at the eastern side of the Agora. It's very interesting that here we have um, a case of a, an area associated with a dead person. Um, that is the founding hero. But the, the law is very keen to make it explicit that this, this space is open to all. This, this you know, very charged and important space in the city um, has complete or near complete access to everyone in the community. That's very important in terms of the uh, collective uh, memory of a given community and that you don't, um, while there are, there are bearers, and in, in, in the instance of Greek religion, we think of, of poets and uh, people within in specific priesthoods, spatially, where collective memory uh, is embedded spatially, these must be accessible. Um, in order to the, in order for them to be um, to take shape conceptually in the consciousness of the community, um, and while my own research has looked at abstract conceptualizations of spaces in the Athenian thought, uh, the way that they look at the the Acropolis without even being on the Acropolis, um, the, the the shrine of Batos in the Agora represents a very um, important mnemonic uh, nematope. Um, and I think it's very, very, um, <laughs> it's very telling that this, this was sort of, you know, open to, open to all except for murderers. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, our next uh, lecture is uh, of Professor Craig Champion, who is Professor of Ancient History and Classics in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and former chair of the History Department at Syracuse University. He is the author of Cultural Politics in Polybius Histories and The Peace of the Gods, Elite Religious Practices in the Middle Roman Republic, editor of Roman Imperialism, Regions and Sources, Editor-in-Chief and co-translator of the forthcoming Landmark Edition of the Histories of Polybius and one of the founders